Should every person in the U.S. who wants a job be guaranteed one? My next guest, Pavlina Cherneva, says yes. As a research associate at the Levy Economics Institute, she's long advocated for a job guarantee program that can act as an income safety net for those who need it the most. However, there are a lot of skeptics out there who argue against it, saying it will disincentivize workers to find a job in the private sector, thereby making it overly burdensome on the government. But here's her argument to that. All right, so there is, there is little evidence that people are going to lose their incentives. In fact, this is a stepping stone. This is how we want to see it. We want to see it as a stepping stone. So we provide a basic um, uh, income or basic um, wage, base living wage, uh, at an uh, employment opportunity where a person can actually get the on-the-job training and education. So that is a crucial component of this program, that we um, help people transition into private sector employment should they desire to move to better paying um, uh, jobs. And one, you know, one way we call this program is actually a transitional uh, job program. Um, the other thing is that we have seen programs around the world, and we have some evidence to see that people are not disincentivized. In fact, they really like their public employment opportunity options. They um, have better uh, labor force attachment. Their children do better. They're, uh, uh, they're able to climb the economic ladder. And of course, they're, they're sort of able to stabilize their incomes as they transition to other forms of employment. So um, I don't think we should see this in terms of costs. Mm -hmm. We ha can only see this in terms of benefits because we already bear extraordinary costs that are already paid for that stem from mass unemployment. Mm -hmm. There are health, crime, um, other political instability costs. There are uh, mental and uh, physical um, uh, uh, problems that come with unemployment. There are long-term effects on families and their children. And so we are bearing the costs. What we are saying is, Let's treat this as a disease. Mm -hmm. Let's inoculate this problem. And let's simultaneously inoculate all the problems that are associated with it by putting the unemployed to work in a public project for the public purpose. So it's a win-win any way you look at it. Yeah, there could be some social benefits, uh, as you mentioned, long-term uh, long-lasting social benefits. Now, recently, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the UK's labor leader, released a 10-point plan, and in that plan, he pledged to, quote, create a million good quality new jobs and guarantee a decent job for all. Now, it doesn't seem like the news media really parsed that out as a job guarantee. However, they are picking up on his openness to a separate program called Universal Basic Income. We've talked about this on the show before. Now, in this case, um, instead of being guaranteed a job, of course, people are guaranteed a set amount of money every single month. And I have heard you say in the past that you are not a huge fan of this program. I mean, what is the case against universal basic income over the job guarantee. Okay, so the, the basic income and the job guarantee um, advocates tend to share the same kind of social objectives and goals. Um, the difference is that the job guarantee actually provides the structure and the institutional means through which to achieve poverty alleviation, to provide public uh, goods and services to the needy, from elevating them from their poverty, and most importantly, stabilize the business cycle. The basic income does not have this counter-cyclical stabilization function. It is supposed to be provided at all times, irrespective of the macroeconomic conditions. So it, every fiscal policy has a counter-cyclical um, feature, except the basic income guarantee. What is worse and what is very uh, troublesome to me is that supporters um, of, the basic in, uh, of the basic income program come from both the left and the right, and in a sense have formed, I would say, an unholy alliance um, to fund, quote unquote, this program by scaling back a lot of other social programs. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is a really a Trojan horse kind of policy where uh, uh, it promises uh, that all social ills will be cured by this single grant, while at the same time um, undermines and potentially eliminates all the hard-fought-for 
welfare programs that we have that are very carefully targeted to the specific needs of uh, those that are most right. needy. And there are different iterations of the universal basic income that have been proposed. And what you're saying, what I'm hearing you say, is that you don't like a basic income that outright replaces the current safety net. But the argument to that is, I mean, what is the case for keeping a program like welfare as robust as it is today if people are going to be guaranteed an income or guaranteed a job? So we, what's missing is the job component. Uh, there is a misdiagnosis of the problem. You know, poverty is not simply an absence of, of income. Poverty is multifaceted, mm -hmm. and we know that employment opportunities are very uh, effective at alleviating people from poverty because poverty people associate with being isolated from their community, from not being respected for the work that they're doing, from not being part of mainstream uh, society and economic activity. So this is a complex problem. And so while I'm very sympathetic to the goals and objectives of the basic income guarantee proposal, it is a bit of a magic wand solution where there's a lot of wishful thinking about what the single grant could possibly achieve to alleviate those who have been most marginalized, discriminated, uh, um, and um, you know, pushed outside of the political process um, uh, can benefit from it. So, um, yes, modern uh, income support programs need a reform, but what they need really is that jobs component. Let's uh, provide income support, but let's at the same time provide an employment opportunity. And if we marry these two, you will see how uh, naturally a lot of the expenditures on, of the other um, social programs that address poverty, unemployment, etc., actually decline uh, on their own. So we should expect a much smaller welfare state per se by simply guaranteeing employment to all. Well, one country we can seemingly look to uh, for an example of this is Argentina. And that's a country, as far as I understand, um, that you have studied uh, greatly. And uh, unfortunately, poverty in that situation was not alleviated by the program. But tell me a little bit more about how it operated there and whether it could be a model of what could work in Western countries like the UK or the US, for example. Yes, very interesting case in Argentina. It was not a job guarantee for all, but it was a direct employment program that provided guaranteed employment opportunity to a head of household. And so the program actually very quickly ballooned uh, beyond what uh, policymakers expected, um, whereas about 13% of the, of the labor force ended up participating in this program at the depths of the crisis. And it, this is where I get actually my inspiration for, for my proposal is that it was federally funded, but it was administered through localities and municipalities on a call for proposal kind of basis where the unemployed and community organizations themselves propose the kinds of projects they need in their communities to address their needs. Now, what's interesting about this program is that even though it wasn't a job guarantee, it exhibited many of the features that I am uh, emphasizing. For example, within a year, the payrolls of the federal government began shrinking rapidly. The economy recovered so quickly that people started transitioning out of this program into private sector employment. It did not alleviate poverty because the income offered was very low. It was below poverty, um, b below the poverty line. So while the minimum wage increased in Argentina, the wage provided through this program didn't really increase above poverty. Nevertheless, it immediately reduced extreme poverty, which is called, we call indigence. Um, and I, I've, I, I had gone and visited an, um, a number of projects and interviewed people, and these are sort of the unquantifiables. The, um, the great impact that this had on the social fabric, on people, on their dignity, on their families. So there is a lot we could learn from these, from these um, projects. And what is interesting is that as a macroeconomic policy, it tended to serve precisely the function that I'm emphasizing. It shrinks in good times and grows in bad times. 